Thank you, Yvonne. Now, this panel and the panel after us have taken on the channel. The, we are going to be high energy. Alejandro has promised us he's going to deliver some insight you have not heard so far this day. And the panel after us is then going to continue uh, that same passion. Firstly, just to acknowledge that David Craig was going to join us. Uh, unfortunately, he caught COVID uh, last night. So um, we've sent him back to his bed um, early in the morning in, in, in the UK. Um, this, pe this panel is about nature-based uh, solutions. Now, nature-based solutions are actions to protect, sustainably manage, or restore natural ecosystems um, to address really societal uh, challenges. They can be carbon-based uh, that tackle climate change, or they can be non-carbon-based to uh, tackle some other challenges like you know, food and water security or disaster uh, risk reduction. Um, they're an important part of our overall discussion today about how do we meet our net zero targets. Um, they're needed uh, if we want to get to uh, limiting warming to no more than 1.5 degrees. And they're also important in addressing some of the biodiversity loss uh, that we are now facing. Um, to tie it back to where Ravi had started us this morning, this is a topic particularly pertinent for Asia where a lot of the opportunities for nature-based solutions actually reside uh, across Asia Pacific, and our panelists will cover some of that. And continuing on a theme that we've had throughout the day, nature-based solutions, and then we'll couple it with blended finance as well, are just not attracting sufficient financing and capital uh, today. So that's something we're going to explore with our panelists uh, across today. And Flora, maybe I'll have you start us off uh, today. Shell has been really quite bold. You've modeled a couple of scenarios that illustrate that for us as, a, as an Earth to hit 1.5 degrees and limit our warming, we need to reforest something like the equivalent of Brazil, right? Yet, Shell has committed that, I think if I'm not wrong, 120 million tons is the target that you've yes. set for yourselves, mm. right, in terms of um, uh, mitigation. Help us understand what are these nature-based solutions? What has Shell done in this space? And you know, how do we encourage others, particularly the financing group that we have here, uh, to be able to do more? Yeah, thank you so much. It's a real pleasure and great honor to be here today. And thank you for having me. Um, Shell, we aim to become a net zero energy business by 2050. And in this context, we believe there are spontaneous actions we need to take to really improve the energy efficiency, to reduce the energy, you know, in carbon intensity in the energy mix, and also to use mitigation to tackle these residual emissions uh, through technology and also nature-based solutions. So in this context, nature-based solutions, we um, make an estimation to use around 120 million tons per annum carbon credits from nature-based solutions by 2030 to primarily mitigate the emissions from hard to abate sectors in our scope three, which actually occupies around 90% of our total carbon net footprint. And back to 2016, that number is around 1.7 gigaton. So it's a big challenge ahead of us. And from that perspective, back to 2018, Shell was one of the very first companies to make a commitment to invest into nature-based solutions. So when I came to the position, honestly speaking, looking around, we were not very clear what that is really about and what can we do to really deliver that ambition. And sitting here today, I sense the hope and I genuinely feel motivated. All of us in this room share the similar vision, have the shared will and also commitment to make this happen. We're running against time to really tackle climate change. So what we do in um, MBS, in the nature-based solution space in Shell, since its inception, we have been building the portfolio and establish the team, develop our capabilities to be able to invest in nature-based projects. So today, we um, operate across 17 countries. Our staff are based you know, across different places in different regions, and we support many projects as well. Just to name a few, 
in Australia through our full, fully owned subsidiary, Select Carbon. Today, we manage about 60 plus carbon farming projects across 9 million hectares, supporting the local farmers to have additional carbon revenue stream through the human-induced regeneration approach, uh, soil carbon approach. And in China, we're working with our joint venture partner, Climate Bridge, to a forest and do grassland restoration projects across 1.5 million hectares. In Zambia, we support the work from Comaco, which is a very, I call it, inspirational social enterprise who managed to aggregate more than 225,000 smallholding farmers across Zambia to work on avoided deforestation and smart agriculture projects. And by working together with them, you know, we support their efforts to expand their existing projects to another 65,000 smallholding farmers. And Senegal, we are working on a 4,700 hectares mangrove plantation together with We Forest, an international landscape restoration NGO. So all in all, I guess from my perspective, nature has the potential to really help us to tackle climate change. It is our obligation to work together, collaborate, to find that solution to really unleash nature's potential. As I said, we're running against time. It is about real action and real impact. Excellent. The minister from Egypt this morning pushed us towards implementation. Uh, and I guess, Flora, this is the way Shell is implementing today, real actual projects across different uh, types of asset classes. Thank you. Alejandro, let me turn to you, and let's start to link blended finance and nature-based uh, solutions, right? Earth Security has published a playbook, um, I believe, called the Blended Finance for NBS, right? Tell us a bit about what inspired this, right? Why did you put this playbook um, together? And, you know, why do you feel this is an important thing to do? And what do you hope that by publishing this playbook, it sort of starts to catalyze across uh, the world. Thank you, Jenny. Um, but look, uh, I'd say the two takeaways for me from this conference uh, so far are one, that we need templates. Uh, that was an amazing point in order to scale. Uh, and we talk a lot about transactions, but what are those templates that are going to assure us that the money that we spent on design facilities and windows actually has the potential to create pipelines at scale so that we stop thinking or talking about the fact that there isn't a pipeline and we start to talk about where that pipeline might be. Um, the second point uh, was the question of how do we do that while avoiding the tipping points that are really looming when we talk about climate security, resource scarcity, and ecological degradation. So that, for me, is the context for, for the conversation. And so I want to talk about how we might approach that from a, from a constructive and positive and strategic perspective. Let me start with one very practical example. The Asian Development Bank has just announced, uh, approved $3.8 million in a facility for catalytic funding to go to incentivize insurance products for coral reefs in Asia. Why? Because coral reefs are more than proven to be a very effective line of defense for coastal communities, cities, infrastructure, power plants, anything that is on the coast to slow down extreme weather events. Uh, we work a lot with insurance companies in, in the Philippines, and, and I can tell you that insurers are already seeing that those extreme weather events that they thought were one in 100 year events are actually happening many times in a single year, which is completely uh, uh, challenging the way they underwrite products. And so the reality check is that we are actually losing all the coral reefs in Asia, right? And this is, must be familiar to you. I mean, we, we, we are losing the coral reefs. So why is it that insurers are not queuing up to, to take some of these products to market because it makes so much sense. And part of that is that these products actually don't exist yet and they don't conform 
to the in way in which insurers do business, and in particular in Asia where, where the insurance, insurance penetration is, is actually quite low in some, in some countries. And so in order for this to succeed at scale, you know, we have an amazing example of coral insurance uh, from NGOs in, in, in Mesoamerica and Mexico that, that we all keep talking about, this one transaction, and it happened in 2016, right? And so when we engage with all these actors and we talk about, well, how might we scale this up? We actually don't have a template to scale that up. And so uh, our proposal is for the template for insurance of corals in this very specific example, that will only work at scale um, if insurers find a way for the insurance clients to pay for the premium uh, and embed that into their business models or for municipalities, governments, or other donors to pay for the performance outcomes in ways that can be deployed um, across everywhere where you have coral reefs protecting communities. And so finally, I'd say uh, for this point, uh, you know, the question and, and the question for us today and for the incredible leadership that, that uh, the Monetary Authority of Singapore is showing with this, with this conversation even, is how do we also take that catalytic capital um, to scale? Um, and that $3.8 million, that is not much, uh, what is the potential? Uh, what is the potential for Singapore to think about this value proposition for the insurance industry in a climate stress scenario, which is very real, uh, in the entire coral triangle, right? So, um, if I can just give one or two more examples, can, can I do that? Yeah, yeah, but you'll link it back to the playbook. Yeah, no, this is what, this little introduction to set the scene yes, of corals in Asia, yeah. uh, which is very concrete. So, so I'd say the abundance of nature in Asia is not going to last forever, you know? Uh, uh, the current rates of loss and overdraw of, of, of nature are incredible. You know, the countries and companies are, are uh, over consuming uh, natural resources and accelerating these tipping points. So we, we've done an analysis and very much drawing on convergence uh, uh, leading work in, in, in this space. And we've asked how many of the, in all the transactions that John was talking, talking about at the beginning, uh, how many of those are nature-based? And we found that it's, it's really less than 5% of overall deals and transactions, uh, partly because of the lack of, of these templates. So. Um, UBS Optimus Maya uh, recently talked about, ju ju just before, was talking about the work we're doing with them on mangroves. So I want to give another example uh, that is very practical to Asia, and, and I want to talk about Indonesia. Um, just Indonesia's cloud forests. You know what cloud forests are? These montane, high-altitude tropical rainforests that have clouds se more than 70% of the time. They're capturing fog. They are sending the water downstream. These, only these forests in Indonesia are sequestering 24 million tons of carbon uh, equivalent per year. And that's a carbon market play, yeah? Going back to the, to the playbook. But the carbon that is already locked in and stored in those forests is enormous. And the, mar the carbon market is not going to give us a financial instrument to preserve that. Now, if Indonesia lost its cloud forests, that is the equivalent of nine times the entire national emissions profile per year for Indonesia. So losing those forests means that Indonesia will never achieve its NDC targets. And that means that there will be no zero, net zero transition in Indonesia. And so we need uh, other parts of the playbook uh, to, to finance the carbon that is already stored in these forests. And that may be some of the b sovereign bonds or issuances, debt swaps, or, or you know, uh, some of these other instruments that were, that were talked about, including sustainability linked loans of companies that are starting to set uh, uh, biodiversity KPIs as part of their, uh, their financing. Uh, now, to me, the most mind-blowing part of this is that 50% of Indonesia's hydropower capacity, its capacity to produce electricity, through a low carbon hydro depends on the water coming down from those cloud forests, according to our data. And out of the seven dams that are in the pipeline for Indonesia today that many of you may be financing, six of those seven depend on those cloud forests for their long-term resilience. So you begin to see how 
even in those infrastructure investment deals, and what may be uh, uh, infrastructure bonds, what may be uh, ways of putting in nature KPI on, on those deals, is actually pretty fundamental to the performance of those investments over the next 20 years. I mean, I'm not talking about the future generations 100 years from now. So back to, so, so um, why did we, on the one hand, develop the playbook uh, uh, on what are the options for, for nature-based solutions, but, but why are we then bringing all this data and strategy to, to the table to, as, we, as we try to guide uh, where do we go from here? It's because we need to radically increase the amount of blended finance that is available, but we also need to have new templates that tell us where are these potential deals that will preserve these natural assets. And that's something that's missing from the conversation today, that is not only about the transactions, it's also about ensuring that the biophysical resources are kept in place, because otherwise there is not zero transition. And so I just finished by saying that, that we're therefore focusing on the how. Uh, how do we do that? And, and the three needs I see, um, in the one, on the one hand, is to grow the comfort of public financial institutions and private investors, the majority of which are not involved in these deals today, on, on what, are, what do these deals look like, understand the deals and understand those pathways to scale, and then finally, in our experience, also increase the mutual understanding between these sectors that have completely different cultures of investment decision-making to really understand how do they fit together and what might be some of those common goals that they could pursue uh, um, and in synergistically. Thank you. I'm going to pick up on some of those, what do we need to do uh, in a minute, right? So we've established, we've got to go upstream, that there is real value in the nature-based solutions. We've established that with the playbook, there's a real need to, we've got good examples, how do we templatize, put this into a way that we can scale, right? So that's where we've established. I'm going to bring Martin into the conversation, um, uh, if we could. Um, Martin, tell us a little bit about Blue Orchard. What do you guys do? How do you define uh, NBS, and why is this something that you deem valuable? Yeah, thank you, DY, and hello, Singapore. Thank you for having me. Blue Orchard is a global impact investment manager with a 20-year track record. Since our foundation, we have invested roughly 10 billion US dollar in more than 100 emerging market um, countries. And with that capital, we are reaching more than 250 million people. Blue Orchard manages the largest commercial microfinance one fund globally, and we offer impact investment solutions across asset classes. Blue Orchard is a member of the Schroeders Group and a trusted partner for many sophisticated investors, including global blended finance initiatives. What are we trying to achieve? Our goal is to combine positive social and environmental impact with attractive financial returns. We want to tackle global inequality and climate change. These are two of the world's toughest challenges. They need solutions that are effective, targeted, and often very much linked up. Within our climate change focus, we define nature-based solutions as efforts to conserve, restore, or improve ecosystems in, in, in order to absorb and store carbon, but then also safeguard biodiversity, which is very important. But why are nature-based solutions so important as a question? Analysis has estimated that these solutions could have the potential to provide around a third of the climate action which is needed to achieve the Paris Agreement goals and to avoid the worst um, effects of climate change. The issue, however, is that they may provide a, a third of the solution, but today, nature-based solutions only receive about 3% of all the global climate finance. So we at Blue Orchard, we want to do our share and contribute to climate action and make nature-based solution, uh, nature solutions an investable asset class for clients. What we are doing is we're looking at projects um, such as conservation, reforestation, afforestation projects, but also sustainably managed um, timber forest projects. And we look at um, those projects globally in emerging markets, and in particular countries with tropical forests. 
tropical forests because they are the largest tree cover on Earth at the moment, but at the same time, they also have the highest deforestation rates. And as they're such, su such vital um, global ecosystems that it's really important to protect them, reforest and afforest um, these places. Some of the criteria we're looking at, um, all of the projects need to satisfy highest industry standards coupled with our in-house impact management framework. And then um, through that, we provide our additionality um, to, to really channel urgently needed monies into the regions where these high quality projects are located. Great, thank you. Thank you, Martin. And Kevin, help us tie some of this together, right? We've got you know, clarity that nature-based solutions are important. Right? You've got folks here who are investing and structuring product uh, around it. Right? Tell us a little bit about what Trisector uh, Associates is trying to do and how in particular you're trying to ensure that you know, we're getting this cross-sector collaboration, um, both across the different types of financing instruments, but also across the different types of players in the market. Thanks, Ly. Uh, thanks, everyone, for your time today. Uh, my name is Kem Tan. I'm the founder and CEO of Trisector. Uh, Trisector, I think of us as the personal trainers, essentially, for governments, uh, philanthropies, and the private sector. Um, and what we try to do is turn the why into the how uh, by filling the structuring gap in making these things happen. Uh, oftentimes, we have different folks come to us from these sides of the table with three questions. Uh, they ask, so I've heard about this blended finance thing. What is it, actually? Second, uh, given my particular problem, which blended finance structure is the one that's right for me? And third, if we're going to do a blended finance structure, how do I make the value proposition make sense to either the government or philanthropy, or if you're philanthropy, then to the private sector on the other side of the table? Uh, so we were set up about five years ago with the help of the Economic Development Board of Singapore. Uh, together with some local financial leaders. And uh, what we do is we help to build these new muscles and do, uh, uh, try and unwind some of the muscle memory uh, of working in a single silo towards working together. Uh, we are set up as a non-profit here so that we can be sort of the honest broker, but also because we see that there's a real need for Asian-focused uh, models given the different types of context in this space. And why that's important is because, just starting from first principles, all blended finance is really is a concrete expression of how the different sectors should work together. And actually, in the Asian context, uh, perhaps the, the, those assumptions driving that expression may be different. So for example, uh, traditionally, we've talked about blended finance being having government play the role of a risk taker. But actually, is that how governments in Asia view their role uh, and it's the social contract such that uh, they can accept not just the financial risk, but the reputational risk. Uh, does philanthropy view itself as a, uh, a way to catalyze the private sector? If not, what are the other ways we can get them in? Uh, so because of that, we've been adapting these different blended finance models to different contexts in Asia, and I'll just share three examples we've done out of Singapore, just make this concrete. Uh, first one's not actually in the uh, green space, uh, but it's interesting to see how there's some cross-pollination going on between the different spaces in this vended finance world. Uh, so the first one we did with Temasek Trust uh, was in the social space where uh, commonly the problem there is offtake. Uh, nobody's usually willing to pay for some of the employment and educational outcomes that innovation could generate. So therefore, there's no upstream innovation. Um, so we designed essentially an uh, advanced market commitment where the Tomasic Trust pre-committed to pay for some of these different outcomes and therefore generated social innovation upstream to solve this. And you could see how these sorts of uh, advanced market commitment type models, in this case, we call it an outcomes amplifier, could be used for uh, uh, nature-based solutions where the outcomes were in employment, for example. Uh, more closely related to the green space, uh, we. Uh, looked at the nature-based uh, solution space in uh, Indonesia, where uh, one of the leading conservation NGOs came to us and said, you know, we want to raise a $200 million fund. 
uh, let's set up a technical assistance facility so that we can solve some of this pipeline issue. But the trouble is that uh, philanthropists, when asked to donate to this technical assistance facility, would say, why should I subsidize the returns of the private sector investors? Right? And there's not enough of the type of institutional philanthropy here to provide that kind of uh, pure subsidy. So in that case, we had to design a recyclable grant facility where the TA facility actually had its own business model and was repaid out of the fund uh, were it to succeed. And so that allowed the fund to raise about $7 million so far in just pure philanthropy. Uh, finally, uh, and I, I think there's a lot more on this space, uh, tying it together with the outcomes-based movement that uh, Maya mentioned from UBS earlier. Uh, we've looked at the waste management space and the recycling space as well. And oftentimes, um, the problem there may not be risk, but actually the market externalities. So for example, in the waste space, uh, it's often that you don't get paid for prevention, you get paid for waste disposal. And therefore, the types of solutions that might prevent uh, waste don't get invested in. So in that case, we actually had to set up a results-based contract to pay for prevention uh, should waste exist. And you could also see how that could uh, play in many cases where uh, essentially a nature-based solution uh, leads to some sort of downstream cost. Uh, so uh, just tying all this together, I, I do think that there is a real potential here in Asia to uh, create different types of ways of working together that uh, might not just be useful here, by the way, but may be useful for the rest of the world. Uh, just give you an example of something that I'm particularly excited about. Earlier this year, the World Bank launched a $150 million uh, Rhino bond uh, to, uh, in which basically investors are repaid for the conservation of rhinos. And I think that that was very interesting because so far we've talked about blended finance as a way only to crowd in more private capital. Uh, so it's very much a resource mobilization play. But actually, I think that that example showed that there can be other reasons and other benefits of doing blended finance beyond pure resource mobilization. And perhaps some of these other uh, rationales might be fit for context in this part of the world, but also others. So I'm looking forward to uh, speaking more. Perfect, perfect. Now, the theme is how, scale, and a bit of specificity, right? So that's where we're going to start to dive uh, now. We have here lots of excitement around nature-based solutions. We know how to do a little bit of blended finance because we've got some experience. We've got a playbook. We've got interested investors, and we've got a coach with us at play, right? which begs the, I guess, billion dollar, actually trillion dollar question, because you said there was nine trillion dollar opportunity. What's preventing more capital, more projects from being done, and for scale to truly happen in the nature-based solution space? What's holding us back? What do we need to do differently? Flora, you look very keen to answer this. Yeah, I mean, I have to start by saying people look at nature-based solutions. It's a very cool and fancy idea nowadays. But when it comes to real investment, it's hard work. Mm. So nature-based solutions, investment into this, it requires interdependent elements to cohesively work together, including elements like scale, like quality, and also cost. And very often, we look at the market reality and the market landscape there are a few characteristics we have to respect. First of all, nature-based solution space is relatively nascent for private sector. Before 2017, only small-scale carbon developers have been working in this space. It has been really contributed and dominated by public service sectors for long. So now the private players, we try to learn how to do it. So there is going to be an inevitable learning curve Secondly, it's about, I call it the regulatory and policy framework. It desires more clarity, certainty, and stability to incentivize more investment into this space. And very often for private investors, it's about expected risks and rewards, understanding of roles and responsibilities, imagine value chain, try to create value while we manage risk, 
when it comes to nature-based solutions, I have to say, we're still trying to find that ultimate clarity of all of this. Thirdly, if I may, that's about a recognized gap in the market, which is more around the development and implementation skills and capacity. You need people and organizations to really help you to deliver these projects. I have to say, you know, I respect all of the numbers. Um, the percentage allocated to nature-based solutions has to be better and larger. Yes, I get that. But compared to three, four years ago, there is abundant amount of capital in the market which is willing to be invested into nature-based solution space. However, very often, you couldn't find that capable developer to help you to really spend this money in a credible and sustainable way. And for a corporate investor, that credible business model matters. If I invest, I want to make sure I see through what type of results, I manage risk well, I deliver impact in a sustainable way. So how to really address this capability gap is also a big you know, challenge ahead of us. So that's why I feel I'm honored to be in the panel with Kevin, and you're working on building that muscle, which is very important. And last but not least, if I may just use the opportunity here, is also about the opinion-rich environment. Nature-based solution space is very opinion-rich. You hear a lot of good views and noises from time to time. Uh, that's why I keep talking about real action and real impact. We get to get started be willing to learn from doing, and be willing to evolve over time. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Kevin, you were nodding your head intensely as uh, <laughs> Flora was speaking. Um, did you want to add to where uh, Flora is going, right? Which is, it's hard. We're building capabilities, and that's exactly kind of where you're going. What else do we need to really kind of, you know, soup, I guess, turbocharge um, action in the nature-based solution space? Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, I, I was struck when I read uh, last year's report by Convergence about the type of concessionary financing that's being provided. So today, 85% uh, of blended finance, if you will, is actually in the form of concessionary capital. And in the nature-based solution space, it seems like the problem may not always be um, a just a return one. So I think the, the gap there seems to be that perhaps the right type of concessionary capital needs to be provided. So for example, um, if in reality, uh, as we looked at in, in the mangrove space in Indonesia, the problem is actually a mandate problem where the private investors cannot, in, cannot do the upfront technical work, then actually we need more grant type capital. If actually the problem is, is fundamentally a business model problem where there are all these externalities that are required to be paid for in order for the uh, business models to make sense given the current price of carbon, then maybe we need governments to step in on that front. Uh, to give you a very concrete example, uh, you know, in the waste space, the French government set up a uh, 27 million uh, outcomes fund to pay for waste reduction outcomes and that by internalizing those externalities, which anyway would have been paid for by the government in some form, uh, that then allowed all kinds of upfront innovation. I wonder whether that is uh, sometimes the problem with the uh, investment case that uh, Flora and the team looks at. Alejandro, did you want to add to the question? You started this around some of the challenges. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Dendi. Uh, look, I, I, I'd say two, uh, and the first, to, to Kevin's point, the, the first problem is not about finance, right? The, the, the first problem is that we are not valuing the ecosystem services that we get from nature. But when we find those opportunities to acknowledge that valuation, then systemic change happens at scale. And I think going back to the question of coral reefs as a, as a really practical example, which is a massive asset opportunity for, for, for Asia, um, if the function that coral reefs are providing communities, governments, municipalities, companies, was acknowledged, um, first of all, there would need to be better data on, on the economic function of the performance of a coral reef vis-a-vis -vis building a concrete cement or cement seawall. 
Um, but, but second, we find there's a question around the engineering mindsets of companies that just don't trust that nature-based solutions will, will perform as well. And so the blended finance space usually talks about not just risk, but also risk perception uh, in, in projects that may not be more risky, but we need to change those opportunities. And so, uh, you know, if, if we have those models of companies that, that use the data and, and, and prove the point, then finance just flows in because the, the, the question we find with insurers, for example, is if we can show which of their clients is willing to pay for an innovative product, the product will be automatically there. This is what insurers do. Um, and I think there's a big opportunity for, for example, sovereign insurance pools, right? Big multilateral pools of sovereign insurance to, for example, recognize uh, uh, that. And then the second one, I think, is about blended finance, uh, which, which is a bit of the objective we had with, with this playbook, which is to say, the, the, we believe there's still a very big margin of increase that public DFIs and MDBs and, and others uh, could take to use more of their capital and use more of their balance sheets for, for blended finance deals. And in order to do that, I think to your point, practically what? Uh, I'd say we need to be able to rally the players in this ecosystem to provide proposals for accelerators and windows but that are working at the level of templates. And, and that is what is, what I think, missing in the space today. Got it. So this is a use the playbooks, right? Use the playbooks, use the templates. We kind of know what we need to do. It's a question of, uh, of, of execution. I want to come back to something that uh, I think, Alejandro, you had touched on earlier, which is, you know, there's quite a lot of excitement around, you know, kind of the carbon markets part, but not all NBS sits as within the, the, the carbon play, right? And um, Kevin, you'd introduced a couple of examples that are actually non-carbon uh, related. Does it make a difference here, right? Or are we, you know, do we just apply common principles, whether it's a carbon-based solution, whether it's, you know, general NBS, whether we need blended finance? Is there a difference here at all? Or are we kind of overcomplicating our lives? Kevin, I'm turning to you, because you're not sure. very friendly. Yeah, it's funny because um, I see an opportunity for reverse cross-pollination. So what happened in the social space was they looked at the, um, the energy efficiency space 30 years ago and said, you know, this problem of how to incentivize people to change their light bulbs to energy efficient things, uh, they, people don't do it because they're worried about the risk, even though they're downstream savings. So why don't we do that same thing in the social space, right? And so what's happened in the social space is they've then had to grapple with many of the issues that you described today while building an intuition, including, for example, what are the outcomes in the first place in the social side, and um, how do we ensure additionality. So uh, what's happening here that I see is that actually many of those same uh, struggles uh, around how to quantify, how to pick metrics, how to ensure additionality have led to some infrastructure being built on that side that could actually be uh, retransplanted and not, uh, you know, uh, bit for bit, but I think can be uh, used to inspire similar types of infrastructure and methods in this particular space. Uh, so I don't think we need to build it from scratch. Uh, and it, there's a lot of cross space pollination that I think we can draw from. Perfect, great. I'm just going to turn to the audience. And in the same way we've had for the other panels, there is a, um, a Slido. Uh, I think we're going to pop up the QR code in a minute. If you've got any questions for the panelists, then please uh, uh, put it on, and we'll uh, start towards some Q&A from the, the panel. As we do that, I'm just going to ask one final question to, to the panelists, right? We've established the value of NBS. We've established that there's lots of experience You've highlighted templates, and actually we do have some of those templates. If you guys had to identify one action, right? One action that, be it a corporate need to do differently, be it a, any part of the value chain, a philanthropist, a government, a, a, um, a person who's structuring some of these products, a player in the financial system today, what would that one action be that you believe would really 
tip us towards scale, right? You're all nodding, so I'm thinking you all have answers to this, right? Kevin, I'm gonna let you go first. Sure, thanks. Um, I think it would be to internalize the externalities uh, from using especially ODA, uh, but also government uh, funds. Uh, so I read that about only 2% of ODA budgets today are, are used for mobilizing private capital. Yeah. Uh, I think if we channeled some of those things which are already being used to pay for downstream costs into incentivizing these upstream solutions, that would make uh, things like NBS a lot more viable. Okay, good. Rora, shall I come to you and then I'm gonna go to Martin? Yeah. So I will speak to the corporate perspective I would like to see all the corporate to embed nature into your investment philosophy and embed nature's risks and opportunities into your decision-making protocols. That has a significant power to actually enable what your normal activities can entail from nature perspective. Yeah. Okay, great. Martin, the one action that you'd love to see any play in the ecosystem take today? Yeah, maybe I'll link this back to the question that we discussed before. What are some of the hurdles for more capital flowing? Why is not more capital flowing into this space? And um, I fully agree that this is a nascent asset class, but it's also an asset class that is very much characteristic, characterized by long-term um, time horizons, right? It, we're talking about trees, for example, or, or other um, um, biological growth cycles, which can often be 20, 30, 40 years. And so I think the one action which would really help bring more capital into the space is commitment towards longer-term capital, um, patient capital that can really support over such longer periods of time. I think this is really um, one of the key aspects um, to, to scale up investments into nature-based solutions. Thank you. Alejandro, what's your one action? Yeah, We've got so some interesting questions coming up on screen. Yeah, I can yeah. see that. Um, look, I would say to pick one, but the first thing to say is that nature is made of carbon. Right? So these are not completely separate topics. And I think what is in the minds of many of you today is really, can we use Southeast Asia's forest to transition to net zero, right? Uh, as a carbon play. Uh, and I think that's not the way to think about it for a variety of reasons, you know, that have to do with, with uh, reputational risk, permanence, and all sorts of other things that, that we can discuss at another time. I think what is very important is to see natural capital as something that both sequesters carbon, as well as provides other services that are fundamental to long-term investments in any of the investment portfolios that you currently have in, in Asia. Um, and, and, and so seeing nature as an asset, which may mean putting it on the balance sheet, as, as Kevin is suggesting in a way, um, or, or, or else, you know, any carbon uh, um, credit play that you're going to do in the next six months should think uh, about that natural stock as something that does much more than carbon. So you don't think about carbon as a commodity only, but think about the broader need for those ecosystems to sustain those investments uh, longer term. Yeah. I'm gonna, just because you brought up carbon, I'm gonna pick up two of the, the questions that we've got. I'm gonna merge them a little bit, right? And you know, one is, to what extent is carbon pricing a precondition for nature-based solutions to have positive returns, right? Um, and, and tied to that, right, it's the, you know, where do some of the revenue streams come from besides carbon credits, right? Because I think those two questions are, are linked. Does anybody want to, Flora, you, you looked keen. Yeah, I mean, carbon credits, the price is a key deciding factor today because carbon credits is one of the, you know, mainstream uh, instrument to make MBS investable asset today. Over time, there may be other type of stuff, biodiversity, and we're running this natural capital laboratory assessment to monitor the whole ecosystem from holistic approach perspective, covering biodiversity, air quality, you know, water quality, and also ecotourism, timber, and so on and so forth. 
the future is bright, but for the time being, carbon plays a key role. Yeah. And I would say, if I may, the last point, it goes back to your fundamental MBS methodology. If it is an improved forestry management, you also have the timber revenue stream. Mm. If it is regenerative agriculture, you link to your agriculture productivity. So there is always a value chain. So don't only stick to one element, think about that holistic picture. Yeah. yeah. So at least for now, it is, you know, it's one way for us to, to price, but in terms of revenue streams, we shouldn't be limiting revenue streams to just uh, carbon credits. I'm getting lots of head nodding here. I think there's a, another question here which is an interesting one, which is, you know, what makes a nature-based solution investable and bankable, right? Uh, and we didn't dive on this one too much, right? Did you, Alejandro, did you want to take that one? I have a quick go. Um, maybe, again, through one very practical example. Um, coffee, yeah? Um, Arabica, which is a coffee we, we're drinking every day. Uh, climate change in the next 20 to 30 years will make 60% of Arabica growing lands unsuitable for coffee. Think about that. And it will push farmers, it is already pushing farmers uphill, meaning that they're driving the deforestation frontier. And at a, a very proven method for growing coffee differently is how coffee used to be grown before monocrop techniques, uh, you know, uh, input heavy kick in, which is underneath a canopy of trees because what the trees are doing is lowering the temperature five, six degrees. It's incredible, right? Um, so this is a fundamental need in order for coffee to be resilient and to preserve the value chain. Um, but that is what a nature-based sol solution actually means in practice, which is that you're not investing in nature in some esoteric way. You're really thinking about your coffee value chain yeah. uh, and even investing in the corporate finance of coffee roasters and retailers that are committing to the value chain. BMP, I think, brought a great point around the off-taking. Uh, that, that's, that's the playbook that has a template built into it. So I want to demythify that nature is just something, it's for, you know, it's just completely different to what we're doing. It's a different way of thinking about business and different way of thinking about investment portfolios. Perfect. Thank you, guys. That time went a little bit faster than I had expected. But I think what at least we've established here is, I think your last point, uh, Alejandro, is an important one, right? While we focus on nature-based solutions, this is not an abstract, you know, kind of in the clouds kind of forest, right? This is also linked very closely to our day-to-day -day lives, to the real economy, right? And therefore, I think, Kevin, as you kind of tried to tie it all together, is in the same way we look at how we finance you know, many other projects, before we even go into blended finance, we can anchor it back into the real economy, the real projects, and the value chains that exist today. And then we can layer on, where necessary, components of uh, uh, blended finance. That means in spending the day uh, uh, talking about. Thank you very much uh, for this. Uh, and if everybody can join me in thanking our panelists, uh, Martin Gar, Kevin Tan, Flora G, and Alejandro Lepotsky. Thank you very much, guys. <laughs>